All right, we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, we'll go through some administrative slides as usual, and then we'll get into our speaker for tonight. So welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for hopping on. Uh, we do appreciate it. I know at least for me, this is starting to get to that busy point in the semester where midterms are coming up, uh, papers are coming up, all that good stuff. So I know time is limited for everyone. So hopefully we can kind of give you a nice little break here for the next half hour, 45 minutes. With that. So as always, but just a quick reminder, uh, if you haven't already, join us on UContact. If you just go to ucontact.com, find our page and register as a member, you'll be on our email list and you'll get all of our updated information about meetings, Zoom links, et cetera, as well as when we hopefully get the transition back into in-person meetings and taking trips again. If you're on our UContact roster, you'll already be set to go to be part of those activities. Stay up to date with uh, SBA. So again, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns ever, best way to reach us is uconsba1 at gmail.com. Um, also follow us on our platforms at uconsba. Uh, you can also get in touch with us by DMing us on those platforms, but we'll post again information about upcoming events we have, different links and things that'll be sent along to us. So a bunch of different opportunities uh, you'll be able to see on our socials. So again, recommend you Follow us on those platforms. Sport Business Conference. So I know we mention it every week, but just a heads up. For those of you who don't know, part of what our club does is we host the annual UConn Sport Business Conference, where we bring in a bunch of different speakers from the industries, uh, have keynotes, breakout sessions, networking sessions. It's a full day event uh, and have a bunch of different representatives from all across the sport industry. So if you're interested in working in sport, I highly recommend attending. Usually the event, if you've heard of it and gone to the past, is in February, but given the restrictions of COVID-19, we're hoping to have some sort of in-person component. So that's being moved to late April, which is now what it looks like. Once the date is set and the tickets are up and all that good stuff, you'll be uh, notified plenty ahead of time. So don't worry about it exactly right now, but definitely something to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, they already have, we have our own uh, separate social accounts, UConn SBC on Twitter and Instagram. So if you wanna follow Sport Business Conference stuff specifically and see updates like that again on when dates are confirmed, speakers confirmed, tickets, all that good stuff, you can find it on those socials right there. Mentioned it last week, but uh, the Michigan, University of Michigan is having their annual Sport Business Conference, which is probably the biggest one in the country every year. This year it is online. So if you just go to the website, which is right here, you can sign up right now and it's free. Uh, looks like they have a lot of good speakers lined up. I'd highly recommend you do it. Like I said, it's free. If you can make some of the sessions, great. If not, not a big deal. You didn't have to put up any money. There's also a case study competition that you'll be able to sign up for if you do sign up for the event. If you're interested in doing it, I believe there are events, there are kind of sections this year for the case study are sport marketing, sport analytics, and there's a professional soccer team. I believe there's some sort of minor league team in Europe. Uh, if any of those areas are interested and you're interested in doing the case study, email us at uconsba one again at gmail.com and you'll see um you can just send us a message saying hey i'm interested um and if we get enough of you we can put you all in a group and we can have an sba group at part of the michigan conference so option there again let us know by emailing us one last thing before we get going tonight next week's meeting will be another speaker we have marcus Lynham, who is was formerly at espn now have been at fox sports for a little while doing sports brand partnerships um he works with a ton of big properties so pretty much all of the big college football conferences and college basketball conferences as well as the usga pba um really cool guy again another uconn alumni so if anything of that sounds interesting to you feel free to join us next week same time same place as well. With that, I'll kick it into tonight's meeting. So tonight we are lucky enough to have Adam Giardino, who I'll let you tell, he's done a lot of stuff. So instead of trying to list his resume off in front of everyone, I'll just let him talk about it. But uh, yeah, Adam, thank you so much for hopping on our call tonight. I know you're a busy man. Um, I'll just get things kicked off with, why don't you give us kind of the, uh, the five minute elevator pitch breakdown of uh, who you are and what you're doing. I think you're muted. Oh, I think you're muted. Awesome. 
So there say, we go. I, I actually wish that I was busier. I, at this time of year, I would normally be very, very busy with college athletics and running around doing all sorts of stuff. But, uh, you know, hey, it, it is what it is. I haven't called the game since March 10th. Last game I did was UConn baseball against Hartford. And then uh, a couple days later, that was that. Um, yep. So the last decade really I've spent in minor league baseball. So I'm from Franklin, Massachusetts. I'm a graduate of UConn 2011. Marcus and I were very good friends. Marcus Lineham and I were really good friends as we were coming through. I was predominantly at WHUS. He was UCTV. Um, he was at the time they had the ESPNU campus connection. So that was kind of his big thing. You can probably ask him about that um, next week. It's sort of a thing that, you know, they do it in the Big Ten now. They do the campus connection stuff. So it doesn't exist like it did back then, but that was his big thing. So we were in classes together and really good friends. So that's cool that uh, you're going to have him next week because he's done a lot of really good stuff as well. Yeah. Um, so I've been in the minors the last decade. Uh, I'm from Massachusetts, as I said. I'm a born and raised Red Sox fan. So my last eight years have been spent with the New York Yankees organization. And uh, I'm currently with the Yankees AAA team in Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Uh, I would be going back and forth every six months to kind of do those games. So I do live and I'm based in Massachusetts. I'm in Worcester right now um, for college sports season where I do work for, I mean, predominantly UConn, that's my main gig. So I'm the sideline reporter for UConn football and radio. Um, so at the end of uh, at the end of every game, I'm the first person that gets to speak to Randy Edsel. So it's been, uh, you know, <laughs> I, th I think moving forward, we're all hopeful. He's hopeful. We're hopeful that there'll be some more pleasant conversations because, you know, I get him for four or five questions right after before he goes talks to the uh, the media. So I warm him up when you see him speak to the uh, the media in a press conference. I've already picked his brain for a couple of minutes, but that's my big role with the football team, and then. Um, men's ice hockey I work those games with Bob Joyce I filled in on women's basketball with him as well and UConn baseball too so um, that's my role with UConn and then really during the fall and winter being in Worcester I'm centrally located to Boston Providence Hartford so I'm just about an hour from all of those so I do games for Providence College Brown University Northeastern BC Harvard Holy Cross even out to UMass I've done stuff at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire so really uh, all over the place, just try to pick up as many games as possible. And that's, you know, I finally, now that I'm 31 years old, I finally kind of gotten to the point where I can say no to things, you know, mm -hmm. when you're, when you're first starting out and it's, yeah, sure. You know, okay, this covers the gas money for me to drive two hours up and do a, a division one hockey game for Dartmouth at Yale, where they call you and go, Hey, do you want to do a game Saturday night? And you're like, okay, this isn't really, making me money. This isn't really helpful in the short term, but you know, in the long term, it, it all pays off. So I'm finally at the point where I can, you know, say, ah, I don't think I need to be doing seven games this week. I think I'll take a night off. But um, again, I don't know if those, I don't know if I'm going to be taking any nights off for a while when this thing starts up and we've got all the fall sports doubling up you know some schools are going to be playing soccer in the spring now and it's going to be interesting to see how it all shakes out but um, it's going to be all hands on deck once once we hit the spring and once this thing really gets going yeah I can imagine any rest you've built up over the last couple months will be quickly depleted once you get back into the full swing of things but I bet it'll feel good at least to start yeah exactly that first broadcast is going to be uh you know like a bat out of hell and then from there we'll see it'll be it'll fall i think into the uh the similar patterns pretty quickly yeah so you mentioned you were a journalism communications major here at uconn and i think a lot of um, a lot of questions people have is like hey how am i learning now actually going to help me when i get into the field because a lot of common things is a lot of it may or may not actually end up helping me once I'm actually on my job doing my day to day. So were there any things that you remember from your time here at UConn that you used either earlier career or still using now that you actually learned within the terms of like classroom setting, uh, sitting down with the teacher, professor, something like that? I hate to date myself, but my junior year, there was a class called online journalism in which we were required to start a thing called a Twitter account. So um, we did that in 2010. So that is my, my Twitter account still exists because of my junior year online journalism class. Um, so that was pretty practical and remains so. Um, you know, with everything I do in minor league baseball, it's, um, you know, in addition to broadcasting, 
college sports stuff, I show up, I do the games, I prep and get ready. That's my role. But in baseball, I am also the media relations manager. And so I'm writing press releases. I'm doing a lot. And um, writing's huge. I mean, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, writing's huge. And for me to have the background of, of journalism writing was really important because, you know, I, I think going from high school to college, we all have that experience when we do our freshman writing class in college where it's, you know, we're dissecting Frederick Nietzsche and, you know, kind of trying to think how you can turn a two page paper into a six page paper. And when you're writing press releases, you're trying to turn a one page paper into a, a quarter page paper. You're trying to just mm -hmm. get the information out there and make it as simple as possible. So my journalism classes specifically really helped with that. Um, and even if, you know, a lot of you are sports management majors, you're, you know, I think as you, you're not getting that journalism training, but I think if you keep that in mind is how can I just distill this into the fewest words possible? That helps you in writing. It helps you in broadcasting. Um, you know, the, the less words you can say something, the, the better it'll be for everybody involved. Um, so that's really when I think about my classes and my courses that I took at UConn, that's the journalism stuff definitely sticks out. Like you said, I was a communications major. Um, I enjoyed those classes. I, I think for what I do now, though, you know, that I'm definitely leaning more towards what I had done with journalism. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're if you are going into the sports business side of things, having some communications background, that would if I was doing ticket sales and I was doing more on that side of things, marketing, um, the communications would have played a bigger role. Yeah, and I think we see a lot of people actually do that double with the calm journalism. So people that are definitely interested in that side of the uh, the sport industry, it definitely sounds like it's worth it to take some classes and and those it could actually end up paying off. Yep. Um. So you talked about what you were doing in the classroom. I know you already mentioned it, but what was some of the stuff maybe you were now doing outside the classroom? So activities, clubs, different stuff that you were kind of doing on the side that definitely helped you kind of get to where you are today. Uh, so when I applied to colleges, so as I said, I'm from Franklin, Massachusetts. So I applied to, I knew I wanted to go into a division one school. I, I knew I wanted to work in sports. I thought I wanted to do broadcasting, but I was going to explore sports writing and, you know, being an SID, all those sort of things. But when I got to campus, uh, and so I applied to Boston College, Quinnipiac, UMass, and UConn. And again, I didn't really know that I was coming to UConn specifically for the radio station component, but I knew it was a D1 school. Mm -hmm. And um, when I got to campus right away, I reached out to the daily campus. I reached out to WHUS, UCTV, and WHUS was the first place that got back to me. And I'm thankful that they did. Within a week, I was doing a men's soccer game. I remember it specifically. It was a top 15 matchup um, back when the men's soccer team was really, really good. My freshman year, my freshman year, 20, the fall of 2007, they went into the NCAA tournament as the number one team in the country. So um, they lost in the Elite Eight to Virginia Tech, but they were a really good team that year. Um, they had the National Player of the Year in O'Brien White. So, you know, going in that, that first week in school, it was, yeah, you're going to be color commentator for John Tewitt. Some of you might know that name. He does PA for the football games at Rentschler Field and Gamble Pavilion. So you hear his name if you're in the stands listening to the games. But he does men's soccer. He just loves soccer. So he always hops on WHUS. So I did the game with him. and. It was just, I knew like that was it. That was the mm -hmm. thing. And so I, I even think that UCTV and the Daily Campus may have gotten back to me, you know, a week later once things settled down, once everybody got to campus. But I was already sucked in by WHO. I was like, I need to do as much with this as possible because calling games is what I want to do. And um, I'm thankful that WHUS was the first to respond. Maybe if, I don't know, maybe if the Daily Campus responded first, it would have been sucked in with them. But maybe I was just looking for a home. But uh, WHUS, that was absolutely where I spent all my time. And uh, by the time I was a senior, my senior year at UConn was incredible. We had the women's team had a 90-game win streak. The um, football team made the Fiesta Bowl. Um, so, you know, we called the, we called the end of the 90-game win streak in Stanford. Uh, they lost to Stanford that night. We slept on the floor of the San Francisco airport. We flew at 6 a.m. down and called the, uh, the Fiesta Bowl the next night. I mean, it was just for, you know, I don't know if Jim Nance gets to do that. I mean, that was mm -hmm. like, that is just historic, you know, that, those kind of opportunities. And then, I mean, that leads into Kemba Walker winning a national title. That leads to yep. George Springer leading the men's, the baseball team to the Super Regionals. It was just an incredible year to kind of be the sports director, to be the one 
penciling yourself in for as many games as possible. So I might have I might have taken too many games that year, but it was a blast. Yeah, I think that's a year a lot of us, at least on campus now, have missed, so to speak, with uh, kind of the success those four teams were were uh, were seeing. But I think we're in a better place. I think we're definitely on an upturn. I'm liking where things are. So I'm I'm hoping maybe not. I'm a senior, so maybe not by the end of my career, but some of the younger uh, members on the call will definitely see something like that before they before they leave UConn here. Uh, yeah, I am optimistic about what Dan Hurley's got going on there. Yeah. Um, so before we move on, I got to get favorite. We, I'm sure you got a lot, but favorite UConn sports memory is just a fan. Didn't ne- not necessarily on the call, but yeah. either watching on TV or in Gamble or at Rentschler. I um, yeah, that's interesting. So as a fan, I camped out for one game, um, and it was my junior year. The the three seniors that were ahead of me um, all um they took the men's basketball game and so I said the heck with this I'm going to camp out and actually Marcus Lynham camped out for this game as well his tent was next to mine so you can we were up all hours of the night that night but it was UConn against Texas the number one team in the country came to Gamble and UConn knocked them off and so as a fan that was definitely my my top I guess my one of the first games freshman year and this is going to feel like an eternity ago but UConn hosted South Florida and that was a top 20 matchup between UConn and South Florida. South Florida had been number two in the country um, and UConn knocked them off and so the students rushed the field at Wrench. It was the first win over a ranked opponent so that was pretty cool as a fan as well. Um, yeah as a broad I mean just as a broadcaster there are so many from that Kemble Walker run I think uh that step back jumper over Gary McGee at the garden any UConn yep. I mean and I got to call that you know I was one of five people that that clip gets played over and over and over and it was me the ESPN radio crew it was the Pittsburgh student station it was the ESPN TV crew Joe Dimbro I mean there are five five six people in the world who got to call that moment and I'm one mm-hmm. of them and that to me was just an absolute thrill yeah I can, I can imagine I can kind of relate I was actually in the stands. I wasn't at UConn yet. I was a junior in high school when we beat Houston that year when at Rensselaer when Houston, I don't know if they were top five. They were, they were ranked. I don't know if they were top 10. Where they, where did they end up? They were, undefe- uh, they were undefeated and like yeah. on their way. Yeah. They were going to make, yeah. they were going to be the, one of the New Year's six bowl teams, I think. If they Yeah. Been. Until we knocked them out. I was there and everyone's still in the field. It's a really cool experience. Uh, again, not one we've been able to have for a while, but when you're when you're there for I think football especially is kind of like a special environment uh, when there's just that big of a stadium, especially in the outdoor in the fall at a night game when you get a big win like that. Uh, there's nothing like college football like that. So yeah, yeah. Hopefully football, we'll see more I mean, of that. My four years at UConn football team went to four bowl games. I know that's inconceivable now, but mm-hmm. it was just it was a run. It was awesome. So yeah, it was uh, it was a special time to be there. So. You, you've already mentioned it, but you called a multitude of sports. Um, so can you kind of talk about why you chose to get into calling a bunch of different ones as opposed to just singling in and be like, you know what, I'm going to call football. I want to call basketball. Because I feel like that's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of students might actually think that might be the route that's best to take by kind of hyper-focusing on one as opposed to trying to be a jack-of-all master of none. Yeah, yeah. It, and believe me, I mean, if I – I mean, from a financial standpoint, just, again, saying yes to as many things as possible is always good for your finances. Um, you know, it's you're a freelancer. In my situation, I'm a freelancer. I don't have a salary. I don't have benefits. I'm just trying to piece this all together and, and make it work. Um, so saying yes to a track and field meet that pays you, you know, 600 bucks for the weekend when you got to do two days of track and field, it's like, okay, this is, yeah, sure, let's do it. Let's, let's make a little money. Um, when you're, you know, this past year I did the Ivy league fencing championships. I'd never set foot in a fencing venue. I mean, it was just, it was incredible and it was a blast. And the person that was my color commentator was a, um, a former Olympian, a former Olympian. So it was just the Harvard hired this guy and I was just picking his brain for, you know, seven hours, one day, eight hours the next. It was a long weekend, but we, we got through it. Um, you know, and but at the end of the day, like, I, I would love to, even right now, you know, Mike Crispino is the voice of UConn football and basketball and baseball. And yeah, I'd love his job. I would absolutely. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, he's 
I hope he's got 15 years left in the tank. But if he doesn't, and um, you know, the opportunities there, I would gladly fill in because those are those are awesome games. The football you get to be on the play-by-play -play call of those games. So, uh, you know, don't let the resume mistake the fact that that's where I want to end up. I mean, that's what I would like to do. Um, but mm -hmm. it just it takes a while. There are a lot of people like me out there that are are trying to get these jobs and um, doing a good job at a, a women's soccer game where you know they know there's less of an audience makes a hiring manager more comfortable to put you on a basketball broadcast where they know there's going to be a larger audience and that's just you know that's true with almost anything in life that's a really good point kind of being able to succeed in those smaller moments is, is really really important mm -hmm. um what, so given all the different sports you've called what's your favorite well the one when you see that sport gets to come up you're like this this is where i get to shine this is this is where i'm in my wheelhouse this is what i love to do Football, truly. Um, but I will say the caveat of when it's minor league baseball, I've done 140 games over 150 days. We actually play in the minors, you play more games in a more condensed amount of time. They get 162 games. They get an extra uh, 30 days to play 22 games more than the minor leaguers. So uh, in the minor league side, we get seven Mondays off and then we get a three-day all-star break and that's it for five months. And we're traveling on buses and no matter where we go, we're staying at the third best hotel. Uh, mm -hmm. The third best hotel in Indianapolis is a lot nicer than the third best hotel in Binghamton, New York. Um, but, you know, they're paying 55 bucks a room no matter what city we go to. So it's just a matter of, uh, you know, what, whatever hotel is willing to accept that money. Um, so the caveat, that's a, a long way of saying if I had to call 140 football games in a year, I might not like it as much. If I had to call yeah. 12 baseball games in a year, I might like baseball a lot more than I do sometimes. But, uh, you know, football for me, uh, the way my mind works, I love being able to, you know, go back and listen to a game, hit play. You've got a 10-second clip, and you can break it down and dissect it and go, okay, I need to do this better, this better. I like what I did here. That's it. Let's move on to the next play. Versus basketball and hockey and baseball, it's more of a free flow of you listen to a five minute clip and you try to figure out, okay, what did I, what did I do during this run of action versus football? It's very mm -hmm. dry. You can just break it down a lot easier in that way. Yeah. And I can imagine that uh, that schedule for minor league baseball would wear on anyone, no matter how much you love what you were doing. So I definitely get that. Um, what, what's the most difficult situation you've ever had to call a sport where you, where you've just been like, this is, I'm totally out of my element or I had to put a ton, a ton of prep work into this to make sure I knew it was going to come out right. Honestly, it was fencing. It really is. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, and again, like I was just as unfamiliar with other sports. I was just as unfamiliar with um, women's lacrosse. The rules in women's lacrosse are pretty different from men's lacrosse. So yeah, the first time that I saw women's lacrosse optically, it's just a lot different. Um, but, you know, doing field hockey, field hockey is a very different sport. Like I said, with um, track and field and swimming and diving, there are just these different sports that, you know, until you've actually put yourself there and you've sat through a six hour swim and dive meet, you really don't know the mechanics of it. Uh, but for fencing, and I've said this, you know, I, I studied and I talked to all eight coaches and fencing coaches and people that are involved in the fencing world they come at you with arms wide open. They want to grow their sport. And it's mm -hmm. a really passionate group of people. So, um, you know, there is no Greg Popovich, so to speak, of the fencing world where you get one word answers. I mean, I'm talking to these coaches and they're, you know, I can go to them on the phone with the Yale coach and just say, hey, so, you know, I, was, I watched your meet. I saw this. It's a basic question, but what am I looking at when I saw one of your athletes do this? And they'll break it down for, you know, I mean, they just want to teach and they want to grow the sport. Mm -hmm. A lot of the coaches in fencing, um, you know, they're the fencing coach of their respective schools, but they also run a fencing academy for middle school kids and high school kids. So like, that's just their world. They want to grow the sport. Um, so for me, fencing was super difficult. It's so quick. Um, the officials hand gestures are even after watching it for 15 hours, it is still so subtle when they are awarding points and they're point, sometimes they're pointing in one direction, but that means that they're awarding it to the other person. So it's really subtle. Again, I had an Olympian that I was working with, thankfully. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, but you know, fencing was after I walked away from day one of that two day fencing event, I, I really was like, 
still thinking, boy, I don't know if I learned a whole lot in day one. And I, I felt like I woke up for day two, like it was 51st days. I felt, or 40, it felt like I was, it felt like it was just groundhog. The next day it was like, my gosh, I need to do this again. And, um, you know, we, we got through it. And the one thing that I will say for broadcasting is, especially in an event like that, where you know the people that are watching are parents, family members, friends, the, the, uh, the thing that needs to go through your head all the time is don't say what you don't know. And that goes for every sport. I mean, that goes for even if it's football, if you're not sure what a penalty is, you know, talk yourself through it, I guess, at times. But if you're really unsure of what is happening, just shut up. And so for me, it was TV. It wasn't radio. I could let this, the pictures just kind of show what was happening. And I would just step aside and not say anything for five seconds. And the Olympian next to me would pipe in. So it was me. I was just saying what I knew. I wasn't saying what I didn't know. Yeah. And you kind of touched on it there. But the next thing I wanted to ask you about is, what really goes into prepping for a game you're going to do? How much research, how much time are you putting in? Cause I think that gets overlooked by, I think a lot of people that are just, they're just popping in to watch, you know, a game, whether it be NFL, NBA, NHL, whatever have you, they think the, a lot of times the announcers are just kind of, Hey, this is what they do for a living. So they just kind of showed up. They may have a list of, they have a spreadsheet in front of them that they might use and they'll just call it. But how much are you actually preparing days ahead of time before you're about to call a game? I am going to, I'm going to pull out a document. I'm going to share something with you guys. I'm going to put this on the screen. So where did I just drag this out of the trash? Okay, there we go. All right, so I'm going to open this. I'm going to share this with you. So this is what it looks like for me to do a basketball game. Can you see that PDF? Yeah. Okay. So this is what my, this is for Brown. Um, you can see that I've got all 12 of their players there. This is what I've got on a manila folder. And, you know, you can see that I've got their important stats, games, points per game, rebounds per game, assists, blah, 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 all that. Those are in those boxes. Um, hometown, high school. I've got where he's, uh, his height, weight, what class he is. And then um, the numbers one through five, they're under David Mitchell's hometown and high school. That's where I mark off when he picks up personal fouls. So I'm always keeping track of that. Uh, this game in that Brown box next to David Mitchell, Saturday versus Princeton, that was the last time that Brown played. So this was going to be a, this was a Friday night game against Penn. And I know this because, so we're sitting on at Brown University on a Friday night. I can say, oh, last game for Brown, D Mitchell played 17 minutes and five points, you know, two or four shooting. I also know that it's against Penn because I have the second line there, which is the last time Brown and Penn squared off. So mm -hmm. I can say, Hey, down at Penn, the first time these two teams played Mitchell played 19 minutes and he didn't score. He was a non-factor that night. So I wasn't at that game, but I have his stats. You can see, I do that for all the players. You just never know what you're going to need. So you try to prepare mm -hmm. for everything. And then, you know, that, those, those small numbers at the bottom for David Mitchell going across, uh, it's a little hard to read, but, you know, that six, six points on December 28th against number two Duke, they played them on the road, eight points against UMass Lowell in November, and then his career high is in red against Bryant this year where he's dropped 11 points. Um, so those are just important as I'm, as I'm going through the broadcast. If David Mitchell, who – he averages three points a game, but if all of a sudden he's got six points, then I can start talking about, oh, okay, he's got, you know, second most points in a game or third most points in a game this year, you know, five points off of his career high, all that stuff. So that's just basketball. I mean, that's just what my basketball um, chart looks like, but I do that for every game. It's like, I'm, it's like you're constantly cramming for an exam, I guess is the bet. You're constantly cramming for an open note exam. The notes are there, uh, just like an open note exam. If you don't make the cheat sheet, you don't have enough time to go look it up on the internet. By the time you know that mm -hmm. moment passes in a broadcast, it needs to be in front of you because you've got your laptop, but by the time you type in David Mitchell's name and you click on his roster and you go to his bot, like it's, it's gone. The point gone. needs to be made 10 seconds ago. So um, yeah, that's what it looks like to prep for basketball. Yeah, so I guess the, uh, the short end to that question might just be a lot. It sounds like just a lot of prep goes into basketball, just for something yeah. as small. This is this one individual basketball game. 
Yes, basketball is uh, – and now I'm reaching for my baseball book. Basketball is uh, about six hours, I would say, per. Um, here's what it looks like. Let's see. Uh, let me pull out a good baseball game that has some notes in it. Some baseball games I ran out of gas. Some baseball games are better than others. But, again, over the course of a 140-game season, let's see. Uh, Baseball, I mean, baseball is hard because you're doing it every night. Mm -hmm. so baseball, this is what my book looks like. It's a lot of different colors. Um, but you can see that I've got in this box here, I've got a bunch of different conversation topics. Again, baseball is such where it's the fourth inning and it's a 6 nothing game already and it's a Wednesday night and there's no crowd. And as a broadcaster, you're sitting there going, I'm kind of bored right now. Mm -hmm. You don't have time to, in the middle of the inning while you're trying to talk, to go to the internet and find stuff to talk about. You need to go, oh, on this day in 1970, July 28th, 1970, Angels catcher Tom Egan commits five passed balls in a game tying an MLB record. Just totally drop that in out of nowhere. It has probably no – maybe I save it hoping there's a pass ball in the game that day. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not. Maybe I'm just so bored that I kind of turn to my broadcast partner and drop that in, and maybe we talk about it for two minutes about how ridiculous five passed balls in a big league game would be. Yeah. Better to have it not needed than needed not have it. Absolutely. So, yep. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so you, you kind of talked about all these different sports you've covered, and I, uh, and I wanted to ask you, because I think a lot of uh, students might be wondering this, but it has ever come up or been an issue either – you felt it or you think other people around you have had an issue that you never really played these sports at the, at the collegiate level or higher or some of these sports, like you said, fencing, like you really didn't have any experience at all with coming into them. So has that ever been an issue for you, like confidence wise, or like I said, have other people ever been kind of apprehensive about it because you don't have that experience? I've never had that, uh, that barrier of self-confidence with that kind of thing. Um, one thing that has been a barrier to me is, asking the dumb question you know I, I travel with these baseball teams so you know when I am with Glaber Torres you know and he's in AAA and I'm chatting with him and just hanging out and it's like you know he's on his way to the big leagues and I just sort of ask him a dumb question of just like how do you get you know what's going through your mind when a ground ball is hit to you that's a really dumb I mean that's a dumb question when you think about it but that was a question I asked him and the answer that I got was incredible. I mean, like just the mm -hmm. amount of things that he's thinking about with his footwork and how, you know, he's thinking about what he's worked on that day during batting practice in terms of fielding. And it just, I mean, that's why he's as good as he is. Um, mm -hmm. But asking the dumb questions sometimes, you can get some really good information. So uh, I've never felt that insecurity. And, but I've had to work on that, where I've had to work on the insecurity of, just sort of, you know, asking that kind of question or asking a pitcher, hey, you know, when you're, and I play, I mean, I, the one, one of the sports I did play throughout growing up through high school was baseball. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say that's the one that I am most comfortable with, but it's still, you know, asking a pitcher about, you know, what is he doing with his lower half and just sort of letting him go with it and just play dumb and see what, see what kind of information you get. And I imagine you start to pick up a lot of that information too, even though you didn't know it because you didn't play it. But if you, if you broadcast and you're in the business long enough and you're asking these type of questions, you kind of end up picking up that information anyway, even though you, you, know, you didn't get it firsthand. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, but I do think that like making, making sure you ask the dumb question is also good because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, asking Glaber Torres that versus Gio Rochella that versus, you know, Tyler Wade that they're all going to have different answers about what's what's going through their mind when a ground ball is coming to them. So it's it's interesting to make sure you get that broad brush stroke of kind of what they're thinking. Yeah. So this next question is something I don't know if anybody else has wondered, but I have always wondered it. So the radio voice that kind of you definitely know you can hear it and you're like, OK, that guy that or that woman belongs on radio. I can I like listening to them opposed to everyone else, that, at least for me. I hear my voice when it's recorded. I think it's terrible. So is that voice you have, is it something you're born with? Like people just have it or they don't? Or is that something you actually had to sit down and over the years constantly work on making sure I had my voice sounding just right for these different calls? 
Okay, so this might be a little bit of a longer answer because I wasn't planning on answering it this way until you asked it. And now I'm thinking a couple other thoughts popped into my head. One, for me, um, it's really interesting. My voice didn't sound that way um, when <laughs> I had a really late growth spurt. So when I graduated high school, I was 5'7", and now I'm 6'2". So my voice changed. I grew seven inches in college. Uh, my, I was walking around campus as a freshman and I didn't have a single pair of pants that fit. So that was, I mean, socially it was a great adjustment for me from day one, right to UConn. And so I was like, you know, I mean, so my voice was always a work in progress in some ways, but it is something that you just, you work on. And, you know, even talking to you right now, my voice has, you know, Talking to you right now, my voice sounds different than if I had talked to you guys five years ago in this setting, but you know, I can, I can really talk and make myself sound like a broadcaster, but like, I can also just talk, you know, it's also mm -hmm. more important, like when I'm on air, I don't talk like that. I don't talk like a broadcaster. I talk conversationally because I feel like there are some broadcasters where you listen to them and you're, and you're just kind of, you feel like you're being spoken to rather than like brought into a conversation. And I feel like, I worked with a guy with the Trenton Thunder in double A where he is the deepest voice ever. And I had to talk to him and we always, you know, kept tabs on each other where it's like, Hey, you know, a little less on the voice. I mean, like, cause he, that's just like, he has to work on speaking higher. Whereas mm -hmm. I have to work on project. I mean, like, so everyone has their own kind of issues working through their voices. Um, but I did suspect you were going to, uh, ask me this so i am going to share something else i am going to i had actually queued up okay so this is going to be me on whus as a c this was 2011 so this is me calling basketball so this obviously espn footage but this is me on whus 10 years ago and this is how i sounded on air to Shabazz, clock starts to tick. 10 seconds, 8 seconds. Finally, falls to Kemba. 6 seconds, works on Stokes. Into the lane, a floater. Yeah! Kemba Walker, 2.5 to go! Kemba with the dribble between his legs. Tries to drive into the lane, nowhere to go. Fades away, steps through off the backboard to himself! A self pass off the glass and Kemba gets it for 2. Kemba has 8 seconds left. Gary McGee is guarding Kemba Walker. Five, four, Kemba into the lane, a jumper. Game over! Kemba Walker puts UConn in the semifinal, 76-74. So that's what I sounded like a decade ago versus this was me doing a men's basketball game a year and a half ago. UConn and Temple tied at 39, but Quinton Rose for the Owls. A pair of free throws coming up to give Temple the lead once more. Rose called for the goaltend. With the ball above the cylinder, even though it was an alley-oop, still called for the goaltend. 15 minutes to go in regulation. Polly with the basketball. Dribbles a couple of times, now defers on a handoff to Taryn Smith. Near side corner, Gilbert. Drop down pass. In the low so that's just basically to say that, like, that's over a decade that my voice has sounded different. So you totally know, different. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just me constantly listening, going back and like trying to, you know, listen and think, what do I, you know, it's not, Oh, I want to sound like Jim Nance. or I want to sound like Sean McDonough or whoever it is. It's me just saying, I want to kind of curate and cultivate my voice in a certain direction. And, you know, I can listen to myself do an inning of baseball and I'll, I've gotten to the point now where I will pick out words when it's like, oh, I didn't like how I inflected on this word. You know, I mean, it's mm -hmm. you're, you're, the amount of trying to strive towards that, like that perfection um, never ends. But you, you kind of you start to get more and more comfortable with your voice. But no, I certainly wasn't born with a, a radio voice or a speaking voice or anything like that. And it sounds like even now, 10 years in, it's still a work in progress. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's like totally a work in progress. And, you know, but again, and I mean, without getting too far in the weeds with like voice and projection and all that, but like, you know, I'm, I'm much more confident, like going up with my voice now, whereas like 10 years ago, I was always trying to have that deeper voice because I couldn't. So it's like, now that I can, 
I try to add different character with like, in, you know, showing more range and it's, yeah, it's always a work in progress. Nice. So um, we'll do maybe one or two more questions and then we'll kick sure. it to Q and A. Yep. Um, so I one have, thing I definitely, I definitely want to ask. No time. I have no time restriction, so I'm free for whatever. Awesome. So one thing I definitely want to ask, so I don't forget to ask you before we end, but a lot of people probably don't know this about you, but can you kind of talk about the, uh, the black play by play broadcaster grant and scholarship fund? Cause I know you founded it, you're running it. So can you talk a little bit about kind of what led to finding, founding that, creating that and uh, what works going into it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for asking. I mean, that's what has been taking up my, all of my waking hours and even my non waking hours as I'm waking up in the middle of the night, realizing I'd forgotten to do something for the nonprofit. It's uh, with the, the murder of George Floyd back in June, it was basically something that uh, I wanted to do. I wanted to, I needed to do something um, beyond just going to protests and, and whatnot. Um, I wanted to make a more tangible difference. And so uh, in broadcasting, there are very few play-by-play -play black voices, in, um, especially in the minor league side. So cutting to the chase, what I ended up doing was reaching out to friends and colleagues and kind of behind the scenes, seeing, hey, can we raise $3,000 for a grant in minor league baseball? When you get in the minors, when you start out in your career, it's a lot of seasonal jobs. And, mm -hmm. there are, you know, out of, out of 160 minor league teams, there's one black broadcaster. Out of the 30 big league teams, there are two. So there are over 200 jobs in major minor league baseball, and there are three black broadcasters right now. So why is that? That's, you know, when you talk about systemic racism, that's the kind of stuff is that nobody's – nobody's not hiring a black broadcaster because they're black. There are other things that are going into this of why, why are we not seeing a sort of proliferation that reflects the diversity of society as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, on the minor league side, it's like, okay, well, I know that um, there's money is a barrier to entry and whether you're white or black in minor league baseball, it's really hard to accept an $800 a month or a thousand dollar a month job out of college for six months. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody has a family safety net that will support them and say, yep, go do this for six months, come back home. We'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. And you know, you, you'll stay on our health insurance and all of that, you know, until mm -hmm. you're 26, which are the benefits that I had, that that was a luxury that my parents were totally fine with me staying on their health insurance until I absolutely needed to and all, of, all those things. So um, you know, not everybody's afforded that. So that was basically what opened up my eyes to like, okay, we need to do something. This is the way we can make a difference. I wanted to raise $3,000 for a grant, a six month stipend. Um, that's 500 bucks a month, basically saying, Hey, here's a little extra money as a safety net in case you don't have one at home. You pop a tire while you're driving to the stadium and you're making 200 bucks a week. You don't have money to eat and fix your tire. So it's mm -hmm. like, just, that was the goal. Um, We've raised over $25,000 right now. We've gotten national. That's incredible. Yeah, we've gotten national uh, publicity from The Athletic and The Ringer and all this good stuff. Um, so this is now, there are scholarships um, that are going out this spring um, to three, three $1,000 scholarships that'll be going out. And basically we're, we're going to, we're working with the support of all these broadcasters um, who regardless of whether in a pandemic they could afford to donate 25 or $50. Um, I have over 50 or 60 broadcasters that said, Hey, I want to be part of a mentorship program. So there are a bunch of professional broadcasters um, that are, we're going to be working with these kids as mentors and uh, trying to increase the diversity in the broadcasting field. Yeah. I mean, that, that's really incredible. I know at least internal talks with our SBA board, I'm sure it was external talks about a lot of places, but following a lot of the stuff we saw, the horrific police without we saw this this summer, a lot of us felt like we had to do something tangible. We, we really tried to like, you know, make, make a difference to actually feel like we were doing something rather than you said, just uh, kind of sharing information and going to protest. And it's incredible, one, you're able to do that. And two, in a, in a, in right in your own field that you love and are affected by. So that's really, really cool. And if you're interested in getting to that and more information on it, check our social links. Um, we are posting a link that's on your website to the information about that. So, and I'm sure people can reach out to questions about you as well with anything about that. So. Absolutely. No, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, the, 
the financial side is fine. I know you guys are all, you're all college students. So, uh, you know, don't, be, don't feel compelled to donate, but certainly I'd love for you all to uh, go check it out. It's www.blackpxp, play by play, blackpxpfund.com and just read it. We've got a really cool, I mean, the board of directors, it's incredible who we were able to get um, on the board of directors. And yeah, it's, we're, we're going to be doing some really good stuff with this. So I'm, ex I'm excited. That's awesome. So last couple of questions and we'll hit right before we open up to Q and a. So you talked about it earlier that you're, you're essentially a, a freelancer. You're, you're, you're an independent contractor that's just kind of going around and finding new jobs. And I imagine an incredibly important part of that is being able to market yourself and being able to get your name and your tape out there and get people to, you know, to reach out to you and, you know, to make a living off of this. So what are some advice to, students right now that are maybe kind of thinking about getting into the business you are and are going to come out of college and want to kind of get into call and play by play or broadcasting. What are some tips for really marketing yourself and in, in that sector of the industry? Yeah, it's uh, it's hard. I mean, I, you know, I'm going to give you the same, Oh, monitor your social media, yada, yada, yada. You know that, but it's, um, I think figuring out what your voice is on social media is important. Um, you know, I'm 10 years into my career. Um, I've gotten more and more comfortable with obviously starting up this nonprofit. I feel more comfortable retweeting and spreading other similar messages on my particular Twitter feed um, that I think tie in with kind of the moment we're living through, um, where maybe a year ago I wouldn't have been quite as comfortable where I would have been more thoughtful of, oh, how is this going to affect my higher ability, um, mm. you know, rightfully or wrongfully, that mindset, that's where my head was at. And so, you know, if you do go to my Twitter feed, um, and you kind of scroll through and you kind of see what I've liked and what I've retweeted, and um, that's, it's a little bit of a different um, marketing of myself, I think, than a year ago, certainly. Um, so, you know, when you're kind of reflecting, and you're thinking of, okay, what's this public persona, if I'm going to broadcast or or if I'm going to go into any facet of, of business, right? I mean, you're making your LinkedIn page. That's pretty cut and dry. There's not a whole lot you can do to get creative on LinkedIn. Um, you can certainly post and all that. But uh, I think that when you're, you know, as a broadcaster, it's finding your voice. Um, and like, and how are you, how are you different than others? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's right. Like last night, I was, and I hope, hopefully I don't call anybody out here, but you're also a college student, so it's fine. But like last night I was watching, uh, no, I, w I was watching baseball and I had no, I had no tabs on like the Packers Falcons game. And, you know, there's this broadcaster that I work with and it was, you know, it was still the Yank the, yeah, the Yankees game was still going on. And, you know, the tweet was, Oh my God, Aaron Rodgers. And it's like, that's not really, I mean, if you're a bright, like he's not on the Packers beat, he's not on the Falcon, like he's not there. It's not his thing, but I mean, he's a, I do college basketball games with him and I do soccer games. And it was just sort of like, I just saw that tweet, not really knowing. I mean, I, I checked the box score and it was like, Oh, he's 18 of 22 for 225 yards in the first half. Like, okay. Like that makes sense. But I always try when I do tweet that like, I always, provide something different, like just a different mm -hmm. perspective, um, show a little depth. And, you know, when you're tweeting about games or you're doing anything like that, I think that's something that I, I learned early was just, you know, find, find your own way to think about things. If you're going to tweet it out, just do, do provide your own perspective. And sometimes like, I'll sit there and I'll be watching a game and I'll want to comment on something and I just won't have anything unique to say. And it was just sort of like, okay, that, that moment has passed and I'm not going to tweet about it. So mm -hmm. I just sort of think that, you know, I think when I look at my tweets and it's like, okay, did I, do I provide a little different perspective? Um, I think that's a way that you could really make yourself marketable. Um, when you're thinking about like, what does an employer look at? they absolutely are going to look at what you're, how active you are on Twitter and kind of the, the mindfulness that you're using when you're, when you're breaking down sports and talking about sports. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Actually 
being original and mindful and tweeting. And I think a big thing is uh, if you don't have anything, like you don't have to say something. Like right. be, uh, be tactful with what you're going to say. Yep. So I know we're approaching seven and I know some people might have to go at seven. So I want to take the time now. Yep. Any members in here that want to ask a question to Adam or comment, question, any, anything like that, feel free. So as usual, um, feel free to unmute yourself, undo your video if you want to ask in person. If you just want to type it in the chat, I can read it aloud. Whatever's easiest for y'all, I'll kick it apart, open for y'all. All right, I guess I'll start. Yeah. Uh, Adam, I missed the beginning of the meeting. I'm Ty. I'm the vice president with Gage. Um, I actually am a journalism and communication student at UConn, and I'm definitely interested in getting into the sports world. So my question is just how difficult was it at first to kind of get those jobs here and there to get these different sports and stuff? Yeah, it was hard, um, just in the sense of, you know, we don't come from a Syracuse, a Northwestern, and a, you know, for me specifically, I, there is no other play-by-play -play broadcaster that's a UConn alum. I mean, there, there is. There are people that, there are alums that work for um, ESPN, and there are things like that. Um, you know, Mark is lining next week, like we said, he works for Fox Sports, and he's done great stuff with them. I think he used to work for ESPN, but on mm -hmm. the marketing side. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's hard to kind of uh, convince somebody that you can do the job. And for me, I was able to use my UConn baseball tape for WHUS to get an internship with the Pawtucket Red Sox. And then one of the days when I was with Pawtucket, I stole away for into a, a spare closet and called a game. You know, they, the game was happening that night. And I told my boss, like, hey, I just want to go and call this game. Um, so I had some tape to come away with and he was like, yeah, that's fine. So instead of doing my normal thing that night, I called the game. And then I used that tape to, uh, get a job with the Lakewood blue claws, um, which is the Philly single a team. And then once I finally was established sort of as a minor league number two guy, that was when I felt comfortable reaching out to like Brown university. And it was, Hey, I do, um, you know, I do baseball for the Philadelphia Phillies minor league team if you have any sports that you'd be comfortable with me doing. And it was, you know, it's, it's, Hey, I do baseball. Can I do soccer? Like it doesn't make sense. I mean, you, you don't have tape of yourself doing radio or TV of a certain sport. Like it's just that person that's going to say, sure. Yeah. We'll let you, we'll let you do it. Um, so I know that's not a good answer. That's not a reassuring answer. And I don't even know if it's specifically what you ask, but it's, it's hard. It's hard to get that first job. It's hard to convince somebody to, give you a job and trust you with something they've never seen you do before, even if you have the confidence in yourself to do it. Yeah, no, that definitely, that covers the answer for me. Definitely. Just one more thing that I have is, um, yeah. so I've become over time, like more comfortable in front of a microphone and in front of a camera and whatnot. But obviously, like you said, it's hard to get out there and sometimes not being having tape or whatnot and people not being able to see your content. So what is, a couple ways that you would say is the best way to help market yourself to get out there for people to realize that you're able to almost do the job or just to kind of get on their radar. Yeah, I, I think um, reaching out to what I, what I love is when people reach out to me with no agenda and it's, it's hard. It's something I don't do very well. Sometimes there's this, and it's crazy. There's this guy, you know, this, this stays not between us, sort of, I mean, but it's, there's a guy, Ted Emmerich, he does games for ESPN. This guy is, you know, he does high school basketball. I did my first games on official ESPN this past winter. It was the, the Hoopal Classic out in Springfield. And he was the guy that did the Bronny Jr. games. He did Sierra Canyon. I mean, he was doing the big national TV games, the Montverde Academy games. So, like, there were, I think there were 13, day, 13 games that we did. I did four of them, and I did – the, the bottom four games. I did the first two on the, of the day. Another guy who was based out of New York City did the next two. And then um, Ted Emmerich does two more, did the night games, which were on national TV. So, right, like this, and this is just an example. Like I was out of the building in Springfield for like two hours before he even arrived. Like I just, it was packed. I couldn't sit around and wait to like meet, meet him and introduce, my, introduce myself to him. So, but he was, he's in the back of my head. It's like, oh, somebody that I need to say, hey, by the way, we actually did the games. I'd love to chat sometime. I still haven't done it. Yesterday, and like, what I really would want for him to do is be like, hey, can you, can you take a look at my 10-minute tape? You know, I've never done a high school basketball showcase. It's different than calling a regular basketball game. Mm -hmm. I still haven't reached out to him. This is months ago. Um, he tweeted at me yesterday 
about, I, I tweeted about goldfish crackers and he actually tweeted at me and like, I made a, and he made a breaking bad joke. And I still like woke up today and his name's on a sticky pad and I still haven't emailed him. So like, just email, like email people with no agenda. Like that's, I guess the best thing in the world to do is don't wait until there's a job on the line. Like just wait, like just email people and say, Hey, can we chat for like 20 minutes? I'd love to just learn more about you and kind of, you know, and then you're on their radar and then they've talked to you. And like, obviously I'm on Ted Emmerich's radar, but like, I still haven't had an actual conversation with the guy. And like, I, I've, I have 10 reasons to have talked to him by this point and I haven't done it yet. So uh, do as I say, not as I do is the point. All right. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Anyone else? Great question, Stop. Yeah. It's all good. I talked for an hour. If you guys don't have any questions, no offense taken. All right. All good. Um, if no one else has any questions, that's all right. Uh, Adam, thank you so much. Uh, this, was, this was awesome. Uh, I enjoyed it. I know our members enjoyed it. And again, we recorded this. We'll post it to our YouTube channel so people that couldn't make it live will be able to see this and see what you talked about. So um, best of luck when things get started up. I know it's going to be busy and uh, it's going to be, it might be a little rough those first couple of weeks, but uh, we really appreciate it, man. Absolutely. Though I, you know, if I hear from Marcus next week that he got three questions, I'm going to be up. I'm going to be so mad. So hopefully, hopefully at least. I'll, pu I'll yeah, put it to the members. I'll say it's a competition. I'll tell Marcus, man, he might, he, he might get a little competitive. We'll have to see. Oh, he's, su he's super, com he's super competitive. So Ty, don't ask him any questions next week. All right. Do me a favor. We'll just leave him in dead silence. Yeah, I'll stay true. I won't ask him any questions. <laughs> awesome. Appreciate that. Thank you for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Everyone right. else, have a great night. Stay safe, and we'll see you all next week. See you guys.